Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the last of the webinar series of the U Data Market Study. We are now just waiting a couple of uh, seconds to let everyone in. People are joining very fast right now. As I said, this is the last of the webinars that we are hosting in the framework of the U Data Market Study, a three year long project for the European Commission, DigiConnect. Uh, today, as you know, we are here to discuss the issue of data in healthcare, and it is quite obvious today uh, how important data analytics is in this domain and in different part of the of the value chain, uh, either for finding drugs, uh, detecting outbreaks, predicting possible failures. Uh, this is actually all we've been talking about in the last three months, and data has been really part of the conversation. So we're really happy today to have some great experts to listen to. Uh, we have a very packed agenda. This is the agenda for today. This is, uh, I will do the introduction, I will chair. Uh, my name is David Osimo, and I'm Director of Research at the Lisbon Council. And I think I've also been invited to assure some gender balance to today's agenda, because as you can see, uh, I'm the only man here. Uh, anyone can ask question through the panel. You have a control panel on your right. You just submit question anytime and I will then uh, report the question to the speakers. Um, we are having today, as I said, a great set of speakers. Gabriela Cattaneo, Associate Vice President at IDC, will present the overall study and, uh, with, in, with the, the look at the measuring the data economy in Europe. Then we have Adriana Locato. Allocato will present her report on the secondary use of health data in the data-driven innovation in the European healthcare industry. It's a report that you can download from our website, datalandscape.eu. And one of the case studies presented in this report, uh, we'll speak after that, Jana Sinipuro. Welcome, Jana. It's great to hear about the Finnish experience who is very much leading the way on the secondary use of health data in Finland. So as you can see, a very interesting and insightful uh, look at the frontier of data-driven innovation in healthcare. We're having some space for question and answer. Feel free to post them, as I said, at any time using the control panel on your right. And I will report either uh, between the speeches or at the end, the questions to the panel. Uh, we will finish at 12 sharp and the recordings of this webinar as well as the presentation will be available on datalandscape.eu where you can also find all the project results, the data, the metrics, the measurement, the reports, the stories and so on. So without further ado, let's move on. Let me give the floor to Gabriella, who will present the overall uh, European data market study, its findings, and its lessons learned. Gabriella, the floor is yours and welcome. Thank you, David. Let me share my screen. I hope uh, this is now showing. Can you confirm? Yes. yes. Oh, perfect just blowing it up. Okay, so thank you very much for participating to this webinar. And my role here is only to provide some word to, to provide the context for this uh, uh, discussion of today and how we want to, uh, what we have been doing in these years. Uh, this is a project which was launched by European Commission already uh, six years ago. And the goal was to measure the European data economy. And this was something that six years ago was new because there was really very little about definitions and uh, understanding of what was going to happen. 
So the overall uh, profile of the study is quite simple. It has three main strands of activity. One is measuring uh, indicators of the European data market, EDM. One is about telling stories, that is uh, uh, doing in-depth studies on specific industries and uh, uh, issues. And today we are hearing from the story about the healthcare data market and data. Uh, so you understand what it is about. And the third the strand is about mapping the data economy and visualizing uh, the, um, the results and uh, building a community of data companies. And this is what the Lisbon Council has been doing and what uh, uh, David was mentioning about the website where you can find all our data. Together, these uh, activities can help, help us uh, to provide policy insights on the European data economy. And I can tell you that uh, thanks also to our forecast scenarios, uh, the data we have provided has been used intensively by the uh, cabinet and the commission. And uh, when you see around data on the European digital economy, this is our data. So what is the methodology? The methodology includes, uh, uh, as we said a few years ago, we developed a taxonomy and a design of the data value chain. We provide data on the key factors of the data economy. So about the data professionals, the data companies, the revenues of the data companies, the data market size, which is the demand side of the, of the data, and the data economy. Uh, the difference between the data market and the data economy is simple. In the data market, we consider only the sales of the technologies and services about uh, big data. In the data economy, we consider the impacts on the industries and on the consumer spending. So it is the overall direct and indirect impacts of the data-driven innovation. And finally, we have a data on the data skills gap about the balance between demand and supply of data skills. And we carry out uh, periodical collection of data and produce our data sets. Again, this is all free and shared. What uh, this year we have, um, what are the key words, the results of this year uh, batch of reports? Uh, um, we have a policy report which summarizes overall results and draws the policy conclusions. I'll just say a few words about what I think are the interesting, uh, most interesting results of this year. Um, first of all, what changes in the post-COVID scenario? Like all of you, we were taken uh, by surprise by the COVID pandemic. Uh, so what we did is to re-elaborate uh, our data for 2020 and forecast to 2025 in a limited way because the project was almost done and we didn't have time to run again our models completely. So we didn't really measure all indicators. And of course, it is also because today there is still a lot of uncertainty and we still are uh, not sure about how the future will develop but we provide some assumptions and some updates of our data uh, that I will share with you in a moment. Um, I think a second concept which is very interesting uh, came out of an uh, analysis by The Economist mainly and other researchers about the model of data in the economy. And uh, this is quite interesting because it compared the different approaches in the US, China and Europe towards data as a part of the economy. And uh, um, they classify three main models. Uh, data as, a, as an asset, uh, the famous data as oil in a certain way, which is the US approach, which means to look at data as something to be bought and sold and used for the economy uh, without much worries for the social impact, for example. And this is a very much the US model. Uh, the Chinese model is data for public value, which means it is actually controlled by the government. Well, you could say everything is controlled by the government in China, but in this case, we know and we have seen it in the COVID-19 epidemic that uh, they use, uh, they're not afraid to use uh, data and the social media, as well as all the ways in which they have data on citizens and vice versa to develop advanced uh, digital services and use them to control the population as well as to provide services. In the case of the European model, this is more data as an infrastructure, which means uh, how data, the idea is that data has to be 
managed and used in uh, with a, a new series of institutions and models uh, public and private uh, like rails or or highways something which has to be considered with public value so regulated in order to work for the common good but also private in terms of being used by private uh, interests and individuals in the best way they see so consider data as an infrastructure which provides additional value to all the economy and society but is also free for uh, private initiative and this is the model that europe is working towards it's a more complex less immediately effective perhaps as data as an asset or as a controlled by the government, but is still very powerful in terms of uh, resilience and building a sustainable model for data innovation and especially for sharing benefits. So um, we thought this was a very good way to explain the European policy and position. The data-driven innovation demand is still powerful even after the COVID scenario. And uh, I think we will see this especially in the healthcare uh, uh, speeches you will hear today, but generally we feel that uh, the reason why data is interesting and useful <clears throat> is not changed. In the new policy scenario, the new commission by Van der um, Loden has uh, um, shown a new centrality of data policy. So for a while it seemed that artificial intelligence was the strategic uh, key but now it is understood that uh, uh, data infrastructures are critical for the European technological resilience and uh, uh, what they call sovereignty. Technological sovereignty is a very new keyword uh, which was uh, uh, presented by the new Commission on Digital Policy presented in the package in February. And this is part of the reason why data-driven innovation is so important and why uh, it is understood that uh, building data access and uh, uh, working towards uh, interoperability of data in order to allow better exploitation and data-driven innovation is today a competitive imperative. Uh, so we, we have seen that our data and as well as our analysis uh, remains extremely important in the current policy scenario. And finally, our indicators model, even uh, in the put under stress as it happened in the recent events uh, has proved its value as the indicators remain valid and the predictions as well as the analysis uh, have proven again and again their validity. So these are more or less the key messages we have for this year research. Um, I want to share with you also our fresh data about uh, the post-COVID uh, updates. So, in the first row, what you see is the value of the European data market in 2018 and 2019. You see the little boxes in the middle, uh, which grew from 55 to 58 million euros, billion euros, sorry, in the EU27. From this year, we have started to measure the, uh, all the data as EU27 member states plus the UK. So the UK is measured, but is considered separately, obviously, because now from 2020 onwards, there will not be EU28 anymore. Um, in 2020, we expected a further growth, and instead we have a fall down. So our current estimates are that the data market fell down by more or less uh, 4%. So a cumulative loss, uh, it went backwards instead of forward. Uh, and this was uh, this is a co caused by the recession and the block of the economy, even though we see that uh, uh, digital uh, services and technologies are still under demand. So what we expect is a bounce back of demand already from next year. In the baseline scenario, uh, by 2025, we had originally foreseen 83 billion value of the data market. It's a pre-COVID uh, uh, cell that you see in the figure, but today we think it will be 80 billion. What happens? What happens is that we think uh, uh, by already, by the end of this year and early next year, there will be a bounce back of growth for the data market services and the tools and technologies, and the compound average growth rate for the next five years from 2020 onwards is going to be actually probably 
higher, a little bit higher than previously expected. However, because the fall down in value this year in 2020 was so strong, the, the scenario foresees a slightly lower value by 2025 than before. Please consider this. I'm not saying that we are going to lose 3 billion in 2025 because of the COVID pandemic, because this was an, a forecast in different conditions. So we are simply saying that compared to a forecast of 83 billion, we now see a forecast of 80 billion which means slightly lower, but it means we also have recovered most of the loss in 2020. Uh, we also examined the other two scenarios, high growth and uh, um, challenge, uh, we call them. They are basically the two extremes. The high growth scenario means how much uh, the economy will grow if uh, the best conditions will happen. And so if the data market moved into kind of hyper growth, for example, by successfully increasing data sharing and multiplying value of the data innovation. As you can see, also in the high growth scenario, we have a slight lower estimate by 2025 with a high growth rate of 14%. So uh, the, the hyper growth will, will have to be even higher in order to achieve this uh, best result. On the other hand, the challenge scenario is not changed because we don't think uh, it's still a scenario of growth because the data market you can see from 2019 will still grow in five years, but will grow much less. And it will be a picture of mainly fragmented and uh, um, economy. Uh, what is changed is the balance of likeliness. What we think is that the baseline scenario remains the most likely. So we still think in optimistic terms of the near future, but uh, the high growth scenario is probably less likely because it's more difficult that, uh, especially for enterprising, they will bounce back so quickly from the problems of this year, given all the other factors. Uh, against them, while the challenge scenario is a bit more likely. So the range of options between uh, uh, the baseline and the challenge could be a range of likely future developments in the sense that if the uh, promised investments, for example, from the recovery fund and the number of other initiatives will not succeed, then the challenge scenario becomes more likely. So. Uh, the challenge becomes a question if we don't recover fast enough. Uh, the baseline is we recover well, and the high growth is an unlikely chance that we can not only recover, but also move into hyper growth. I hope this is sufficiently clear. One more thing. When we talk about the data economy and the data market, we talk about the multiplier. Why? Because uh, one euro spent in the data market uh, which means in the technologies of data, generate eventually, thanks to increased revenues by companies and increased uh, spending by consumers, between five and six euros in the data economy. And this is the famous power of innovation and specifically of data innovation. Um, according to our um, scenarios, uh, we had foreseen a, a range of six and seven euros in the data economy, so an increasing multiplier by 2025 in the baseline scenario. In the new baseline scenario post-COVID, we still see a multiplier of uh, 6.3, so higher in the range as before, but on the lower boundary. So this fits with what we say. What changes in the data economy is the balance of impacts, because uh, we still have good direct impacts from the data market, indirect impacts by industries, because we expect them to invest and improve their services and their revenues. We foresee in the next few years a lower consumer spending because we think consumer spending because of uh, a lack of jobs uh, and the problems uh, uh, caused by the recession as well as uh, fears which reduce spending will bounce back more slowly than the other components of the data economy. What are the policy assumptions by scenario? Uh, in all three scenarios, the policy initiatives are, and the government initiatives have a, play a very important role. 
in the baseline scenario, in order to happen, we see uh, a, a successful implementation of Digital Europe and Horizon Europe programs, especially in the development of data infrastructures and therefore achieving better technological sovereignty and access to data. Common data spaces could be a very important uh, factor to help this in several strategic industries. And we see an effective regulatory framework of data governance uh, in the high growth scenario, that will mean a really faster development of data infrastructure and digital resources, as we say. We think a, a game changer could be very fast digital transformation and especially uh, skills, development of skills and knowledge, which are the real engine for uh, data uh, innovation. And finally, the successful deployment of a European cloud infrastructure, which is one of the factors which allows scalability of data applications. In the challenge scenario, this could happen uh, conversely if the digital Europe and data strategies are not implemented as successfully. We don't expect them to fail completely, but to be uneven. So to have uneven development and maybe some countries in Europe uh, fall back and some regions fall back. And more especially, I think a critical difference between the three scenarios is the extent and effectiveness of the digital single market and the, the data governance framework. Market fragmentation is fatal for data flows and data innovation. So I give you back, I think I'm, uh, I more or less gave the overall scenario that we see for data innovation. And in this context, uh, I think it's interesting to look further into the healthcare industry. So, uh, David, I give you back the floor. Thank you very much, Gabriella, for this uh, very quick but very insightful overview of uh, um, the data economy and the data market. And of course, you will be able to find much more information and data on the website and in the reports. Now we are focused on numbers, uh, billions, GDP, uh, revenues but of course data is not only measured by this it's also measured by societal indicators and very much so in health data where we know that uh, the data adoption and the data maturity of the sector is not just creating revenues but it's saving lives so the different adoption of data in healthcare and we have seen it uh, and we are seeing it today is actually having a direct impact on the number of deaths. So this is obviously something that we are all reflecting on. And uh, this is uh, what uh, we are going to hear from Adriana Allocato, Research Manager AC. How is uh, the health sector embracing the data-driven innovation? Adriana, I will now give you the floor. Thank you. Just want to. Okay. Can you see my screen? Excellent. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Let me see. Sorry. I cannot see my screen. Okay, yeah, can. great. Can you see yeah. my screen, right? Perfectly. Go ahead. So thank you so much, David, for this quick introduction. And as you already mentioned, it's quite obvious just because we are talking about the data and how we can harness uh, the value of, uh, of this data is quite obvious to start this presentation with uh, a quick, telling you a quick story about what's happening in this in these last days, in the current days, and in the last uh, uh, three or four months uh, here in Europe, about uh, uh, sadly all over the world. So, uh, since the start of uh, COVID-19 outbreak, data visualization has played a critical role to understand trends and pieces data uh, together, so that uh, we can build a meaningful story to understand what's happening uh, uh, everywhere. And the World Health Organization has uh, been clear in urging countries to share data in order to halt the spread of the virus. And uh, that has been quite terrific um, here in Italy. 
and uh, there is the story of an hospital in, uh, in Pavia, the hospital of uh, San Matteo in Pavia that has been struggling a lot with uh, uh, critical ill patients that has been increasing in the last few months because of this uh, uh, terrible virus. And to, um, to fight against this virus, uh, what was important for this hospital, but in many other situations, was to track the data of the patient, not only to understand what was working within the hospital, but what was safe, what was not working, what exactly they need. So they need the data to understand the, the path that they have to, to follow and to chase to, to face this, this terrible situation that has no precedent in our history. And they have been collecting this data through the adoption of their analytics dashboard and to guide all type of decision um, of its crisis unit. So the system was also used to, to timely uh, information, to send timely the information to, to the regional and national organizations that were coordinating the crisis uh, and the epidemic response. Of course, in the faith uh, against the novel coronavirus, decision makers need accurate information, real-time information. And uh, this is just uh, the latest example of how data are really important to win even pandemic and the success of uh, communication and uh, data exchange has been played a really critical role. So the story of the current days has demonstrated that the European healthcare system really needed to accelerate the, their path toward the digital transformation, toward so the adoption of um, an intelligent enterprise to be able to be resilient and continue to ensure value to all patients both in terms of outcomes but also in terms of uh, experience. However, this is just a quick example of how tracking data um, is, uh, is helpful for more than one scope. That is not only to take care of the single episode of care, but also to, to, to plan the response of a, of a, of a, of a pandemic. So therefore, the, the aim of this presentation is to give you an understanding of, of the power of data and data-related technologies is, um, is triggering in the process of digital transformation in Europe and this radically changing the, the healthcare industry. Given that, over the next 10, 15 minutes, so what I want to explain you, or at least to try to give you an answer, is to, to the following key question. First of all, to understand what are the key trends and the challenges of the European healthcare systems, and what are their digital priorities to succeed in this fast-paced scenario and how they can promote and contribute to the development of um, a data-driven approach. So first of all, let's try to, um, to set the, 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 the scenario to understand what are the key challenges of the European healthcare ecosystem. So one of the first points is to make it clear that the European healthcare system are uh, on their journey of long-term reforms based on a combination of personalized medicine and integrated care pathway. This means that they are building, they are working uh, on uh, to, to build a value-based healthcare model where the value of the patient is more or less at the center of every type of, of decision. So what is important is that uh, um, we have to ease the pressure on health service demand and such pressure have indeed been more urgent by usual, uh, usual elements and pillars like the rising costs, new regulation governing patients' rights and quality of care provisions, but also uh, shrinking financial resources and skills to be allocated to the healthcare delivery. A second um, element that is, uh, uh, that is uh, driving the change of the healthcare ecosystem in Europe is for sure the digital deadlock that the European healthcare providers are still experiencing today. Even, even if everybody is talking about digital transformation, also in the healthcare market, 
European healthcare providers can still not take the, the most and the best from digitalization. Uh, this, they still need to figure out how to scale out the benefit they are seeing to, to the whole enterprise, align this benefit to, to, to new requirements of the value-based healthcare and create a new value through digital enabled healthcare services. So they are still stuck in this situation. And the third point is that uh, we can see the proliferation of data. We can see a lot of data sources in different forms. Um, we have written data, we have a video, and they are coming from uh, personal devices, from uh, um, uh, clinical tools, uh, uh, but data sharing remains a challenge. We still don't have data integration technologies that is able to really capture uh, the, the information that all this data together can give us. So these three points, as I said, have highlighted the dynamic landscape of European healthcare ecosystem which are then called to implement new digital capacity to pick up the pace of their digital transformation and then realize care delivery and cost efficiency benefits. So our European system, our European healthcare system can succeed in this scenario. What are the digital priorities that they need to overcome these challenges? First of all, they need to build digital capacity and this is essential to, to build a more granular and automated level of access uh, to, to the data. This is clear by, uh, by the numbers that we at IDC collected recently where we see that uh, more than 60% uh, of European healthcare providers consider data management as a priority to build digital capabilities. So as long as we recognize, or at least the European healthcare providers recognize the value of data and the importance of analyzing this data, both for internal, but also for population management scopes, they are working in this direction. So they need to, 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 to prioritize concretely this data management um, uh, needs they still need to build the, the foundation of an effective data-driven approach. And what are exactly the foundation of this data-driven approach? We can see that a data-driven approach is composed by three different pillars. So first of all, healthcare organization has to embed a data-driven culture. Uh, to address both clinical and uh, business goals and uh, treating data as a strategic asset with um, uh, processes and systems that allow the right data to inform decision making and uh, drive actionable results allows uh, healthcare providers to become more responsive to patients but also to, to business needs. The second pillar is for sure to, to identify the appropriate digital capabilities uh, to, to enable data interoperability, but even to, to ensure the, the access uh, to, to the analysis. So uh, analytics is, is, the, is the way to move towards digital transformation and uh, cloud, IoT, uh, mobile, uh, artificial intelligence, all these type of technology have the, the potential to disrupt the whole area of um, uh, healthcare providers, uh, clinical and business workflows, as long as they are uh, appropriately uh, applied. And the, the third pillar is for sure to, to meet regulatory requirements to protect both data privacy and data security. So is uh, to ensure an effective data governance and managing data assets includes both uh, the definition of rules, of standards and procedures, but also the identification of the roles and the responsibility of every employee within the organization that is working with the data. So basically, once we have set the, the key three challenges of the healthcare ecosystem and 
we have decided, at least we have, underst we have understood that building a data-driven approach based on these three pillars is essential to overcome the, 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 the above challenge. Uh, we can go deep inside to these three pillars to understand exactly the action, the active practical actions that the, the, the healthcare organization can put in place to, to, to realize this data-driven approach. So first of all, data-driven culture is essential to share and manage data uh, as key asset, key strategic asset of digital transformation. And healthcare providers are already trying to uh, embed this data culture within their own organization. This is clear by uh, some numbers that uh, we can see. I'm sorry, just experiencing, I cannot see my screen, okay. So this is clear by some numbers that we have collected in the last uh, annual survey. Um, first of all, more than 60% of healthcare providers uh, leverage a core data platform to based on data management, like uh, um, artificial intelligence and machine learning to expand the digital platform beyond the conventional layered architecture. Then we can see an increase in the adoption of or in the investment of data analytics solution as enable uh, as enabler of digital transformation. And uh, I'm sorry. And uh, last but not least, the last data point is that uh, we can see an increase of um, data capitalization and data monetization as a key priority for healthcare organization uh, to, to build uh, in their journey toward the digital transformation. So given the scope of data culture, to, to build this data culture, they also need to, to, to embed some data. Uh, sorry. Okay, we they also can needed to I get some. To, can I ask you to um, go a bit faster because we are running a bit out of time? Thanks. Oh, yes, sure. So, we also need the data governance to create secure, standardized, and interoperable accessible pools. And this is essential also to enable the secondary use of health data. So, this means that uh, we are building, we are uh, collecting data not only for the, the, the scope of uh, patient care, but even to a large population health management care, but also for um, specifically hospital goals. Uh, and um, as the, the value of secondary use of health data is becoming bigger in, in our European context, we can see even the, the rise of, a, of a, a new movement that is the data donation in Europe. That is acquiring a lot of, of, of importance because data donation enables the, the creation of data set uh, that can serve multiple purposes behind the ones that, uh, behind the ones that the, 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 the first scope they, they have been collected. So um, just because they required um, the voluntary donation by the, the single patient, it's not so quite spread, but we can see later in the example, in the real example that Jana will present us, that is something that is really spreading because every patient is understanding the importance of, uh, of data donation. So the, the last but not least important pillars of a data-driven approach is to build on digital capacity. That means uh, uh, investing in the solution like artificial intelligence that has already been adopted by the 30% of Euro European healthcare providers, but we can see also uh, an increase in the adoption of this solution. The same can be said in the specifically big data and analytics solution. Uh, that um, is a still where many providers are still struggling to get external data, but it's something that we can see is, is getting bigger and bigger, especially after what is happening in the last few days. So after, after we said, the, the, after we explained it, the, the data-driven approach and its foundation, what we can get from, uh, the, the, from this story? 
First of all, that the secondary use of this data is becoming strategic, both for healthcare system, but even for healthcare organization. So what we can do on the other side, what we can suggest to the healthcare providers to do is to enable the, the access to intelligent solutions, both for clinicians and for patients. But we also have to ensure that data governance is quality recognized and accepted within the single organization. But we also have to adopt digital solutions to get the most from the health data inside. So just to connect uh, to what I uh, to, to the story that I told you at the very beginning of this presentation, uh, the data analytics and the big data analytics uh, dashboard uh, has showed uh, their importance, especially in the last few months. And uh, this APNED teaching us that pandemic um, showed us that healthcare is something not local, but is global and the adoption of good data analytics could help us to save lives, not only the lives, the, the life of the single person, but to understand much more better the trends and what happenings in the world. So I really hope that what's happening in these days and this terrible story that we are experiencing uh, will teach us how to best manage data and their value that is much more behind the, the, the first scope that we collected yet. So, David, I hope that I was still in time and I give you back the floor. Perhaps we can discuss in the Q&A session much more better uh, some points that the attendees want to, to understand better. Thank you very much. You were late, but it was so interesting, interesting that it was worth waiting. So let's now give the floor to Jana Sinifugo, who will tell us really, you know, after the big picture that Adriana has shown us, let's look at really how it works concretely, how can policy and uh, projects and innovation really make a difference in healthcare. Uh, Jana, the floor is yours. Welcome. Nice to have you here again. Okay, so it's all set now. Um, yeah. Absolutely. We can see the, you and the presentation. Okay, so good morning, everyone. And and um, I'm very happy to be here and and tell some pra practical views um, and on Citrus experience working for the secondary use of health data in Finland. Um, and also about our new initiative, uh, focusing more on the human centric or my data approach to the healthcare data. I think we will need that for a sustainable future. Um, Citra's role uh, is quite unique, uh, just a brief uh, introduction to, to this, because we are working under the parliament, but we are defining our agendas independently. So we work very closely with the government, we fund our public sector innovations, uh, but since we run on our own endowment capital, the current value is about 700 million euros, uh, we invest about 30 to 40 million euros every year on our operations. So we are over 50 years old organization focusing now mainly the big themes being the data economy, human driven data economy and uh, circular economy. So we do lots of sense making, we call ourselves a think do and a connect tank. So I think this collaboration we facilitated during the uh, previous project preparing for secondary use of healthcare data was one of the successes that is now advancing quite well uh, into the practice, uh, the, the legislative part and, and the actual operating model. Uh, we also do, of course, we cooperate a lot with other think tanks like the Lisbon Council, but we also do our own uh, inside activities. And uh, I think this technology is becoming embedded in everything. That's going to be a huge uh, opportunity for, for healthcare sector. But we also need to define, redefine the rules on how we want to use the technology and ethics and, and maintaining trust will be extremely important in the future. Also, I think the new tribes and communities arising, uh, patient groups, segments are getting smaller and smaller people are more active, more aware of the health issues uh, that will change the paradigm of healthcare services in the future. But let's now go back to, to uh, 
to the work we've done done earlier. And of course, uh, the National Accounta Services, the long history of digital services in Finland is a very good background and very good base to start building uh, for primary use solutions, digital solutions, but also uh, it's a very good space. It's a structured data, national IDs that allows you to combine different registers. Those are the important background factors making a secondary, this legislation for secondary use and secondary use of uh, data easier than, than uh, in many countries. But also that's very Scandinavian or Nordic approach as well, uh, high high degree in digitalization. Uh, what is quite nice is that the counter services are used both by citizens and professionals. So it's a huge central data storage and you can also um, manage your consents. You can see your e-prescriptions uh, through one, one central data point. So it's very useful both for the professionals and, and citizens. And that's maybe one of the factors that uh, also improves trust for, for data sharing and, and data usage. Then um, I used to work as a project director, this digital health hub project that we're preparing the operating model for FIN data, the National Data Permit Authority, now known as a FIN data. And uh, as I said in the beginning, we always work very closely with the different ministries. Uh, and other stakeholders. So the whole uh, national health sector growth strategy was the backbone for this project we started in 2015. Uh, and there were several components, uh, also the Ministry for uh, Trade and Industry, Economic uh, Growth and Industry was active in defining this healthcare agenda. So since the very first Faces in the project, uh, there was a strong national commitment and also the focus on companies and, and healthcare data facilitating economic growth in, in Finland. So we launched our project uh, Isaacus in 2016 uh, or late uh, 2015. Uh, we used to work through experiments, practical showcasing, and we funded like a couple of uh, pre-production pre pilots. We worked with the register agencies, register uh, agencies in Finland to streamline the processes, uh, created some metadata solutions, but we also wanted to test new bold technologies like uh, data lake solutions for near real-time data processing. That's a citrus role to challenge the status quo of the of today and 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 look into the future. So we made a kind of, uh, we had a many stakeholder meetings and, and we wanted to make sure that there will be a budget money also allowing this new permit authority to start its operations. So a strong national commitment and Citra's role is to, to be, uh, keep the wheels rolling before there's any actual budget money for, for those public sector agencies to act and also to, to facilitate public-private partnership projects. And then we use temporary steering group to, to fine-tune fine the operating model. There were several rounds in the parliament, uh, lots of discussions about secure data environment, uh, different categories of data usage, uh, what's anonymization technologies we should use, uh, what's pseudonymized data. So lots of concep conceptual things uh, re redefined in during the parliamentary round. In total, uh, Citra invested about 7 million euros to, to this project and the total budget, if you count also money coming from the university hospitals some public agencies, was about 14, 14 million euros. Uh, lots of events, interviews, fact-finding. Yeah, this is the way how we created a commitment. And we are very happy to see the FIN data up and running um, uh, 1st of January this year, 2020. A one-stop sh uh, shop uh, offering services uh, across different register, register holders and clear definitions for secondary use, including teaching, use of statistics, knowledge management in daily operations. And uh, 
of course, this ensuring the trust, uh, creating a model that's uh, that has some uh, public sector agencies taking care of, of security of data and 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 code of conduct for using the data and and asking for research uh, descriptions uh, before giving the permit to use integrated sets of data. Uh, that that was one of the uh, one of the key things in in success, and I think that's also very important in the future. Then for the companies, uh, and also when we ma made some impact analysis afterwards, um, this uh, approach uh, and funding of uh, different university hospitals so that they could build their own data lake systems. Uh, on near real time data for near real time data processing uh, was considered to be one of the big uh, advantages uh, in the project. So I think there is quite good uh, ecosystem of different companies working around the whose uh, data lake solutions. And now we need to ensure that these uh, models uh, and large use of data lakes near real time data used for AI development will be uh, ensured also in the future. I think this is very typical to Finland, very high trust on public agencies, so that made the, the background or that made, made it a little bit easier maybe to create a centralized model and very um, extensive legislation on different categories of data usage. But on the other hand, I think that even generally uh, in UK, the Open Data Institute made, an, made a survey a few months ago uh, saying that actually also UK people, the trust in NHS is very high. And uh, then public or private sector companies, it's not so high. So I think we need to find in the future, we need to find a way to balance between the needs and innovation capabilities in private organizations, but also um, this uh, trust factor that mostly comes from, from the government uh, engagement. Of course, we had many reforms ongoing at the same time, biobanking reform, genome law. Um, the mindset for the officials is still very production driven. Uh, it should be more like customer driven. We streamline the processes to be, be more service driven, but but uh, but I think it's a good start. Uh, and also this conceptual, having same concepts and understanding about different categories of data, different use cases for data, that's crucial if we want to create sustainable infrastructures for data usage. Uh, this cross-sectional dialogues, hybrid for data lake solutions and personalized medicine, for me, was the uh, biggest uh, biggest wins in the project. Um, just a few months ago, we also had nice news from the EU Commission, and, and this week we were selected to be the uh, coordinator. Citra will be a coordinator for joint action uh, that builds on European health data space. So this is just a draft for discussions. We we just uh, started uh, drafting uh, drafting this initiative, uh, but it's going to be great to to try to influence and and have a structured way to to give this insight to to the whole Europe what we did in Finland. So at the moment, uh, Citra will be the coordinator, and there are 25 member countries involved. The time span, it will start uh, in March 2021 20, uh, and duration is two and a half years. And in this draft uh, preliminary discussions, the governance model for the secondary use of health data, considering differences in different countries, different cultures, different regulatory frameworks, is uh, one of the uh, big, uh, big results from, from the, hopefully from the joint taxon. Uh, focusing on data quality framework, economic models for data exchange, and then technical and investment framework. Those are very ambitious goals, but uh, at least, uh, uh, but they are all very important if we want to succeed uh, in Europe. And then we won't stop there because we are a future house. Uh, we think that we should also take more consideration into into persons and individual rights on data sharing. 
So this is the vision we, we work for. In 2025, we would like European citizens to have an so-called easy living apps or so that they can choose those services that use data in a trustworthy way and are tailored to their personal needs. So fair data label, the same way like this trade, fair trade label, uh, people should know that this is a sustainable use of data. This is uh, based on European values and uh, people can re-consent the use of data at its source, combining purchase data, counter service data, sports tracker data, and then knowing when, it, when it's the best time to go jogging despite of your asthma asthma challenges. We need to work parallel uh, with the business ecosystems and business models and also create technical platforms. Uh, but the focus should be in a new innovative services. So if you want to use data, it's the relevant services and service side uh, that should be in focus. That's, uh, that's what the, also the Gardner analysts and others are saying. So we are working on this paradigm from fair data economy, how to use the, what, what is going to be the future model for European data economy, uh, focusing on services, going from infrastructures to the more holistic data markets. Uh, we've done lots of pilots, uh, piloting the new technology needed uh, to enable this uh, data portability and, and consent-based data sharing. Oriola is a very good example where, uh, where they ask, uh, build voluntary cohorts for pharma research. And it's all transparent. It's uh, used in, in, in ph pharmacies where they, where they also can contact and ask for people to agree on, on medical trials. Uh, we just launched our uh, first version of a data economy testbed. So, uh, as I said, Citra is working with uh, fact-finding, but also, uh, also providing practical solutions to test the ideas in practice, walking the talk we are, we are doing. So that will be interesting uh, open source based uh, place for businesses and, and tech developers to meet and test uh, how they can build on new, new services and use internet as a big data platform uh, and using data as a product data as a commodity uh, and building the global data markets so this is uh, the big uh, task we have in in five years time building uh, global data markets but so that they are based on the ethics and european data values as I said, we do lots of fact-based recommendations, lots of surveys across Europe, lots of citrus, citrus work. We don't state anything unnecessary, but we focus on, 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 uh, yeah, on practical findings and facts. And, and I think that's the role that uh, an agency working under the Finnish parliament should, should have, being very stick to the facts, but innovative in, in their mindset. So, in my uh, 25 or 20 years in, in working with data and analytics in private companies and now at Citra, I think that this is going, this is going to be a very interesting and also promiseful opportunity for Europe to define our own, own way to go towards data economy. Moving away from platforms to, to further. Yes, thank you. Wonderful. Many thanks, Jana, for this very insightful presentation. We have seen there is much more than fin data and health data thinking behind. And actually, we can see that healthcare is is pioneering a new approach to 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 the data economy in in Finland. And it would be very very interesting first to hear more about the results when when you have them. So this is a, an open invitation to you to come back to us and tell us how it's progressing, what what the results are but also looking at how this can be transferred. You know, uh, everyone knows that Finland is at the forefront of that economy. What, how can we scale it up at the European level? And this is what we've been hearing from you and also from Gabriella. So thank you very much for this. We don't have uh, time left for questions and answers. So uh, in, the, in the interest of time, I would just make a last call if anyone has a question. Otherwise, I'm sure you have all been 
overwhelmed from the content that we have heard uh, today and uh, it's clearly something that uh, needs greater reflection and a little bit of time to to think about it so in the meantime i will just uh, want to thank you very much everyone from uh, for your participation uh, this has been the, the last uh, webinar of the da european data market study but of course uh, this topic will not go away the data economy data in healthcare we will keep working on this and with some of the speakers here so i very much look forward to continue working with you and discussing with you in future occasion in the meantime thank you very much and I hope you have had an interesting hour with us. Goodbye. Goodbye, thanks.